Chapter 6 The Frogs and the Lobsters For coming, said Midshipman Kennedy. Midshipman Hornblower's unmusical ear caught the raucous sounds of a military band, and soon, with a gleam of scarlet and white and gold, the head of a column came round the corner. The hot sunshine was reflected from the brass instruments. Behind them, the regimental colour flapped from its staff, borne proudly by an ensign with the colour guard round him. Two mounted officers rode behind the colour, and after them came the long red serpent of the half battalion, the fixed bayonets flashing in the sun, while all the children of Plymouth, still not sated with military pomp, ran along with them. The sailors standing ready on the quay looked at the soldiers marching up curiously, with something of pity and something of contempt mingled with their curiosity. The rigid drill, the heavy clothing, the iron discipline, the dull routine of the soldier were in sharp contrast with the far more flexible conditions in which the sailor lived. The sailors watched as the band ended with a flourish, and one of the mounted officers wheeled his horse to face the column. A shouted order turned every man to face the quayside, the movements being made so exactly together that five hundred boot heels made a single sound. A huge sergeant major, his sash gleaming on his chest, and the silver mounting of his cane winking in the sun, dressed the already perfect line. A third order brought down every musket butt to earth. One fix! Bayonets! roared the mounted officer, uttering the first words Hornblower had understood. Hornblower positively goggled at the ensuing formalities, as the fuglemen strode their three paces forward, all exactly to time like marionettes worked by the same strings, turned their heads to look down the line, and gave the time for detaching the bayonets for sheathing them, and for returning the muskets to the men's sides. The fuglemen fell back into their places, exactly to time again as far as Hornblower could see, but not exactly enough, apparently, as the sergeant major bellowed his discontent, and brought the fuglemen out and sent them back again. I'd like to see him laying aloft on a stormy night, muttered Kennedy. Do you think he could take the main topsail earring? These lobsters, said Midshipman Bracegirdle. The scarlet line stood rigid. All five companies, the sergeants with their halberds indicating the intervals. From halberd to halberd, the line of faces dipped down and then up again, with the men exactly sized off, the tallest men at the flanks, and the shortest men in the centre of each company. Not a finger moved, not an eyebrow twitched. Down every back hung rigidly a powdered pigtail. The mounted officer trotted down the line to where the naval party waited, and Lieutenant Bolton, in command, stepped forward with his hand to his hat brim. My men are ready to embark, sir, said the army officer. The baggage will be here immediately. Aye, aye, Major, said Bolton the army title and the navy reply in strange contrast. It would be better to address me as my lord, said the major. Aye, aye, sir, my lord, replied Bolton, caught quite off his balance. His lordship, the Earl of Edrington, major commanding this wing of the 43rd foot, was a heavily built young man in his early twenties. He was a fine soldierly figure in his well-fitting uniform, and mounted on a magnificent charger, but he seemed a little young for his present responsible command but the practice of the purchase of commissions was liable to put very young men in high command, and the army seemed satisfied with the system. The French auxiliaries have their orders to report here, went on Lord Edrington. I suppose arrangements have been made for their transport as well? Uh, yes, my lord. Not one of the beggars can speak English as far as I can make out. Have you got an officer to interpret? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Hornblower. Sir, you will attend to the embarkation of the French troops. Aye, aye, sir. More military music. Hornblower's tone-deaf ear distinguished it as making a thinner noise than the British infantry band. Heralded the arrival of the Frenchman, farther down the quay by a side road, and Hornblower hastened there. This was the Royal Christian and Catholic French Army, or a detachment of it at least. A battalion of the force raised by the émigré French nobles to fight against the revolution. There was the white flag with the golden lilies at the head of the column, and a group of mounted officers to whom, whom Hornblower touched his hat. One of them acknowledged his salute. The Marquis of Posaguet, Brigadier General in the service of His Most Christian Majesty, Louis the Seventeenth, said this individual in, in, in French by way of introduction. He wore a glittering white uniform with a blue ribbon across it. 
Stumbling over the French words, Hornblower introduced himself as an aspirant of his Britannic Majesty's Marine, deputed to arrange the embarkation of the French troops. Very good, said Posaguet. We are ready. Hornblower looked down the French column. The men were standing in all attitudes, gazing about them. They were all well enough dressed, in blue uniforms, which Hornblower guessed had been supplied by the British government, but the white cross belts were already dirty, the metalwork tarnished, the arms dull, yet doubtless they could fight. Those are the transports allotted to your men, sir, said Hornblower, pointing. The Sophia will take 300, and the Dumbarton, that one over there, will take 250. Here at the quay are the lighters to ferry the men out. Give the orders, Monsieur de Mocouton, said uh, Posaget to one of the officers beside him. The hired baggage carts had now come creaking up along the column, piled high with the men's kits, and the column broke into chattering swarms as the men hunted up their possessions. It was some time before the men were reassembled, each with his own kit bag, and then there arose the question of detailing a fatigue party to deal with the regimental baggage, and the men who were given the task yielded up their bags with obvious reluctance to their comrades, clearly in despair of ever seeing any of the contents again. Hornblower was still giving out information. All horses must go to the Sophia, he said. She is accommodation for six charges. The regimental baggage, he broke off short, for his eye had been caught by a singular jumble of apparatus lying in one of the carts. What is this, if you please? he asked, curiosity overpowering him. That, sir, said Posaget, is a guillotine. A guillotine? Hornblower had read much lately about this instrument. The Red Revolutionaries had set one up in Paris and kept it hard at work. The King of France, Louis XVI himself, had died under it. He did not expect to find one in the train of a counter-revolutionary army. Yes, said Posaget, we take it with us to France. It is in my mind to give those anarchists a taste of their own medicine. Hornblower did not have to make reply, fortunately, as a bellow from Bolton interrupted the conversation. What the hell's all this delay for, Mr. Hornblower? Do you want us to miss the tide? It was, of course, typical of life in any service that Hornblower should be reprimanded for the time wasted by the inefficiency of the French arrangements. That was the sort of thing he'd already come to expect, and he had already learned that it was better to submit silently to reprimand than to offer excuses. He addressed himself again to the task of getting the French aboard their transports. It was a weary midshipman who had at last reported himself to Bolton with his tally sheets and the news that the last Frenchman and horse and pieces of baggage were safely aboard, and he was greeted with the order to get his things together quickly and transfer them and himself to the Sophia, where his services as interpreter were still needed. The convoy dropped quickly down Plymouth Sound, rounded the Eddystone, and headed down Channel, with HMS Indefatigable flying her distinguishing pennant, the two gun brigs which had been ordered to assist in convoying the expedition and the four transports, a small enough force, it seemed to Hornblower, with which to attempt to overthrow the French Republic. There were only 1,100 infantry, the half battalion of the 43rd and the weak battalion of Frenchmen, if they could be called that, seeing that many of them were soldiers of fortune of all nations, and although Hornblower had enough sense not to try and judge the Frenchmen as they lay in rows in the dark and stinking tween decks in the agonies of seasickness, he was puzzled that anybody could expect results from such a small force. His historical reading had told him of many small raids in many wars launched against the shores of France, and although he knew that they had once been described uh, by an opposition statesman as breaking windows with guineas, he had been inclined to approve of them in principle as bringing about a dissipation of the French strength, until now, when he had found himself part of such an expedition. So it was with relief that he heard from Posaget that the the troops he had seen did not constitute the whole of the force to be employed. In fact, they were indeed only a minor fraction of it. A little pale with seasickness, but manfully combating it, Posaget has laid out a map on the cabin table and explained the plan. The Christian army, explained Posaget, will land here at Quiberon. They sailed from Portsmouth, these English names are hard to pronounce, the day before we left Plymouth. There are 5,000 men there under the Baron de Charette. They will march on Van and Rennes. And what is your regiment to do? asked Hornblower. Posaget pointed to the map again. Here is the town of Musiac, he said, 20 leagues from Quiberon. Here, the main road from the south crosses the river Marais, where the tide ceases to flow. 
It is only a little river, as you see, but its banks are marshy, and the road passes it not only by a bridge, but by a long causeway. The rebel armies are to the south, and on their northward march must come by Musiac. We shall be there. We shall destroy the bridge and defend the crossing, delaying the rebels long enough to enable Monsieur de Charette to raise all Brittany. You will soon have 20,000 men in arms, the rebels will come back to their allegiance, and we shall march on to Paris to restore his most Christian majesty to the throne. So that was the plan. Hornblower was infected with the Frenchman's enthusiasm. Certainly the road passed within 10 miles of the coast, and there, in the broad estuary of the Villan, it should be possible to land a small force and seize Musiac. There should be no difficulty about defending a causeway such as Pouzaget described for a day or two against even a large force. That would afford Charette every chance. Um, my friend, um, Monsieur de Moncouton here, went on Pouzaget, is Lord of Musiac. The people there will welcome him. Most of them will, said Moncouton, his grey eyes narrowing. Some will be very sorry to see me, but I shall be glad of the encounter. Western France, the Vendée, and Brittany had long been in turmoil, and the population there, under the leadership of the nobility, had risen in arms more than once against the Paris government. But every rebellion had ended in defeat. The royalist force, now being conv conveyed to France, was composed of the fragments of the defeated armies, a final throw of the dice, and a desperate one at that. Regarded in this light, the plan did not seem so sound. It was a grey morning, a morning of grey sky and grey rocks, when the convoy rounded Belle-Isle and stood in towards the estuary of the Villan River. Far to the northward were to be seen white topsails in Quiberon Bay. Hornblower, from the deck of the Sophia, saw signals pass back and forth from the indefatigable as she reported her arrival to the senior officer of the main expedition there. It was a proof of the mobility and the ubiquity of naval power that it could take advantage of the configuration of the land so that two blows could be struck almost in sight of each other from the sea, yet separated by forty miles of roads on land. Hornblower raked the forbidding shore with his glass, reread the orders for the captain of the Sophia, and stared again out at the shore. He could distinguish the narrow mouth of the Marais River, and the strip of mud where the troops were to land. The lead was going in the chains of the Sophia, crept towards her allotted anchorage, and the ship was rolling there uneasily. These waters, sheltered though they were, were a bedlam of conflicting currents that could make a choppy sea even in a calm. Then the anchor cable rumbled out through the hawse hole, and the Sophia swung to the currents. All the crew set to work hoisting out the boats. France, dear beautiful France, said Pouzaget at Hornblower's side. A hail came from over the water from the indefatigable. Mr. Hornblower! Sir! yelled Hornblower back through the captain's megaphone. You will go on shore with the French troops and stay with them until you receive further orders. Aye, aye, sir. So that was the way in which he was to set foot on foreign soil for the first time in his life. Pouzaget's men were now pouring up from below. It was a slow and exasperating business getting them down the ship's side into the waiting boats. Hornblower wandered idly regarding what was happening on the shore at this moment. Without doubt, mounted messengers were galloping north and south with news of the arrival of the expedition, and soon the French revolutionary generals would be parading their men and marching them hurriedly towards this place. It was well that the important strategic point that had to be seized was less than ten miles inland. He turned back to his duties. As soon as the men were ashore, he would have to see that the baggage and reserve ammunition were landed, as well as the horses, now standing miserably in, in improvised stalls forward of the mainmast. The first boats had left the ship's side. Hornblower watched the men stagger up the shore through mud and water, the French on the left and the red-coated British infantry on the right. There were some fishermen's cottages in sight up the beach, and Hornblower saw advance parties go forward to seize them, at least the landing had been effected without a single shot being fired. He came on shore with the ammunition to find Bolton in charge of the beach. Get those ammunition boxes well above the high water mark, said Bolton. We can't send them forward till the lobsters have found us some carts for them, and we'll need horses for these guns too. At that moment, Bolton's working party was engaged in manhandling two six-pounder guns in field carriages up the beach.
They were to be manned by seamen and drawn by horses commandeered by the landing party, for it was in the old tradition that a British expeditionary force should always be thrown on shore dependent for military necessities on the countryside. Bouzaget and his staff were watching impatiently from their chargers and mounted them the moment they had been coaxed out of the boats onto the beach. Forward! For France! shouted Pouzaget, drawing his sword and raising the hilt to his lips. Moncouton and the others clattered forward to head the advancing infantry, while Pouzaget lingered to exchange a few words with Lord Edrington. The British infantry was drawn up in a rigid scarlet line. Farther inland, occasional red dots marked where the light company had been thrown forward as pickets. Hornblower could not hear the conversation, but he noticed that Bolton was drawn into it, and finally Bolton called him over. You must go forward with the frogs, Mr. Hornblower, he said. I'll give you a horse, added Edrington. Take that one, the roan. I've got to have someone I can trust along with them. Keep your eye on them, and let me know the moment they get up to any monkey tricks. God only knows what they'll do next. Here's the rest of your stores coming ashore, said Bolton. I'll send them up as soon as you send some carts back to me. What the hell is that? That's a portable guillotine, sir, said Hornblower, part of the French baggage. All three turned and looked at Pouzaget, sitting his horse impatiently during this conversation, which he did not understand. He knew what they were referring to, all the same. That is the first thing that will be sent to Musiac, he said to Hornblower. Will you have the goodness to tell these gentlemen so? Hornblower translated. I'll send the guns and a load of ammunition first, said Bolton, but I'll see he gets it soon. Now, off you go. Hornblower dubiously approached the roan horse. He knew about riding, all he knew about riding he had learned in farmyards, but he got his foot up into the stirrup and climbed into the saddle, grabbing it nervously as the, as the reins of the animal started to move. It seemed as far down to the ground from there as it did from the main top, from the main to gallant yard. Pouzaget wheeled his horse around and started up the beach, and the roan followed its example, with Hornblower hanging on desperately, spattered by mud thrown up by the French horse's heels. From the fishing hamlet, a muddy lane bordered by green turf banks led inland, and Pouzaget trotted smartly along it, Hornblower jolting behind him. They covered three or four miles before they overtook the rear of the French infantry, marching rapidly through the mud, and Pouzaget pulled his horse to a walk. When the column climbed a slight undulation, they could see the white banner far ahead. Over the banks, Hornblower could see rocky fields. Out on the left there was a small farmhouse of grey stone. A blue uniformed soldier was leading away a white horse pulling a cart, while two or three more soldiers were holding back the farmer's frantic wife. So the expeditionary force had secured some of its necessary transport. In, other field, in another field, a soldier was prodding a cow along with his bayonet. Hornblower could not imagine with what motive. Twice he heard distant musket shots to which no one seemed to pay any attention. Then, coming down the road, they encountered two soldiers leading bony horses towards the beach. The jests hurled at them by the marching column had set the men's faces in broad grins, but a little way farther on, Hornblower saw a plough standing lonely in a little field, and a grey bundle lying near it. The bundle was a dead man. Over on the right was the marshy river valley and it was not long before Hornblower could see, far ahead, the bridge and the causeway which they had been sent to seize. The lane they were following came down a slight incline into the town, passing between a few grey cottages before emerging into the high road along which there lay the town. There was a grey stone church, there was a building that could easily be identified as an inn and posting house with soldiers swarming round it, a slight broadening of the high road, with an avenue of trees which Hornblower assumed must be the central square of the town. A few faces peered from the upper windows, but otherwise the house was shut and there were no civilians to be seen except two women hastily shuttering their shops. Pouzaget reined up his horse in the square and began issuing orders. Already the horses were being led out of the post house, and groups of men were bustling to and fro on seemingly urgent errands. In obedience to Pouzaget, one officer called his men together. He had to expostulate and gesticulate before he succeeded, and started towards the bridge. Another party started along the highway in the opposite direction, to guard against the possible surprise attack from there. 
A crowd of men squatted in the square, devouring the bread that was brought out from one of the shops after its doors had been beaten in, and two or three times, civilians were dragged up, up to Pousage, and his orders were hurried away again to the town jail. The seizure of the town of Musiac was complete. Pousage seemed to think so too. After an interval, for with a glance at Hornblower, he turned his horse and trotted towards the causeway. The town ended before the road entered the marshes, and in a bit of waste ground beside the road, the party sent out in this direction had already lighted a fire, and the men were gathered round it, toasting on their bayonets chunks of meat cut from a cow whose half-flayed corpse lay beside the fire. Farther on, where the causeway became the bridge over the river, a sentry sat sunning himself with his musket leaning against the parapet of the bridge at his back. Everything was peaceful enough. Pousaget trotted as far as the crown of the bridge, with Hornblower beside him, and looking over the country on the farther side. There was no sign of any enemy, and when they returned there was a mounted red-coated soldier waiting for them, Lord Edrington. "'I've come to see for myself,' he said. "'The position looks strong enough in all conscience here. Once you have the guns posted, you should be able to hold this bridge until you can blow the arch, but there's a ford passable at low water, half a mile down, lower down. That is where I shall station myself. If we lose the ford, they can turn the whole position and cut us off from the shore. Tell this gentleman, what's his name, what I said. Hornblower translated as well as he could, and stood by his interpreter while the two commanders pointed here and there and settled their respective duties. That's settled then, said Edrington at, at length. Don't forget, Mr. Hornblower, that I must be kept informed of every development. He nodded to them, and wheeled his horse and trotted off. As he left, a cart approached from the direction of Musiac, while behind us a large clanking heralded the arrival of the two six-pounders, each drawn painfully by a couple of horses led by seamen. Sitting upon the front of the cart was Midshipman Bracegirdle, who saluted Hornblower with a broad grin. "'From quarter-deck to Dunkard is no more than a step,' he announced, swinging himself down. "'From Midshipman to Captain of Artillery!' He looked along the causeway and then around him. "'Put the guns over there and they'll sweep the whole length,' suggested Hornblower. "'Exactly,' said Bracegirdle. Under his orders, the guns were wheeled off the road and pointed along the causeway, and the dung cart was unloaded of its contents. A tarpaulin spread on the ground, the gunpowder cartridges laid upon it and covered with another tarpaulin. The shot and the bags of grape were piled beside the guns, the seamen working with will under the stimulus of their own novel surroundings.' Poverty brings strange bedfellows, don't it? said Bracegirdle, and wars strange duties. Have you ever blown up a bridge? Never, said Hornblower. Neither have I. Come, let us do it. May I offer you a place in my carriage? Hornblower climbed up into the cart with Bracegirdle, and two seamen led the plodding horse along the causeway to the bridge. There they halted and looked down at the muddy water, running swiftly with the ebb, craning their heads over the parapet to look at the solid stone construction. It's the keystone of the arch which we should blow out, said Bracegirdle. That was the proverbial recipe for the destruction of a bridge, but as Hornblower looked from the bridge to Bracegirdle and back again, the idea did not seem easy to execute. Gunpowder exploded upwards, and had to be held in on all sides. How was that to be done under the arch of a bridge? What about the pier? he asked tentatively. Well, we can but look and see, said Bracegirdle, and turned to the seaman by the cart. Hanny, bring a rope there! They fastened the rope to the parapet and slid down to a precarious foothold on the slippery ledge round the base of the pier, the river gurgling at their feet. "'That does seem to be the solution,' said Bracegirdle, crouching almost double under the arch. Time slipped by fast as they made their preparations. A working party had to be brought from the guard of the bridge, picks and crowbars had to be found or extemporised, and some of the huge blocks with which the pier was built had to be picked out of the shoulder of the arch. Two kegs of gunpowder, lowered gingerly from above, had to be thrust into the holes so formed, a length of slow match put in at each bunghole and led to the exterior, while the kegs were tamped into their caves with all the stones and earth that could be crammed into them. It was almost twilight under the arch when the work was finished. The working party was made to laboriously climb the rope up to the bridge, and Bracegirdle and Hornblower were left to look at each other again. I'll fire the fuses, said Bracegirdle. You go next, sir. It was not so much a matter for argument, 
Bracegirdle was under orders to destroy the bridge, and Hornblower addressed himself to climbing up the rope while Bracegirdle took his tinderbox from his pocket. Once on the roadway of the bridge, Hornblower sent away the cart and waited. It was only two or three minutes before Bracegirdle again appeared, frantically climbing the rope and hurling himself over the parapet. Run! was all that was said. Together they scurried down the bridge, and halted breathlessly to crouch by the abutment of the causeway. Then came a dull explosion, a tremor of the earth under their feet, and a cloud of smoke. Let's come and see, said Bracegirdle. They retraced their steps towards where the bridge was still shrouded in smoke and dust. Only partly, began Bracegirdle, as they neared the scene and the dust cleared away. And at that moment, there was a second explosion, which made them stagger as they stood. A lump of roadbed hit the parapet beside them and burst like a shell, spattering them with the fragments. There was a rumble and a clatter as the arch subsided into the river. That must have been the second keg growing off, said Bracegirdle, wiping his face. Should have remembered the fuses were likely to be of different lengths. Two promising careers might have ended suddenly if we'd been any nearer. Well, at any rate, at least the bridge is gone, said Hornblower. All's well that ends well, said Bracegirdle. Seventy pounds of gunpowder had done their work. The bridge was cut clear across, leaving a ragged gap several feet wide beyond, which the roadway reached out towards the gap from the farther pier as a witness to the toughness of the mortar. Beneath their feet, as they peered out, they could see the riverbed almost choked with lumps of stone. We'll need no more than an anchor watch tonight, said Bracegirdle. Hornblower looked round to where the roan horse was tethered. He was tempted to return to Musiac on foot, leading the animal, but shame forbade. He climbed with an effort into the saddle, and headed the animal back up the road. Ahead of him, the sky was beginning to turn red with the approach of sunset. He entered the main street of the town and rounded the slight bend to the central square to see something that made him, without his own volition, tug at his reins and halt the horse. The square was full of people, townsfolk and soldiers alike, and in the centre of the square, a tall, narrow rectangle reached upwards toward the sky with a glittering blade at its upper end. The blade fell with a reverberating thump, and the little group of men round the base of the rectangle dragged something to one side and added it to the heap already there. The portable guillotine was at work. Hornblower sat sick and horrified. This was worse than any flogging of the gratings. He was about to urge his horse forward when a strange sound caught his ear. A man was singing, loud and clear, and out from a building to the side of the square emerged a little, pro a, a little procession. In front walked a big man with dark curly hair, wearing a white shirt and dark breeches. At either side, and behind him walked soldiers. It was this man who was singing, but the tune meant nothing to Hornblower. But he could distinctly hear the words. It was one of the verses of the French Revolutionary song, echoes of which had penetrated even across the channel. Amour sacré du la patria, sang the man in the white shirt, and when the civilians in the square heard what he was singing, there was a rustle among them, and they dropped to their knees, their heads bowed, and their hands crossed upon their breasts. The executioners were winding up the blade again, and the man in the white shirt followed its rise with his eyes while he sang without a tremor in his voice. The blade reached the top, and the singing ceased at last as the executioners fell on the man with the white shirt and led him to the guillotine. Then the blade fell with another echoing crash. It seemed that this was to be the last execution, for the soldiers began to push the civilians back towards their homes, and Hornblower urged his horse forward through the dissolving crowd. He was nearly thrown from his saddle when the animal plunged sideways, snorting furiously. It had sent of the horrible heap that lay beside the guillotine. At the side of the square was a house with a balcony, and Hornblower looked up at it in time to see Pouzage standing there, wearing his white uniform and blue ribbon, his staff about him and his hands on the rail. There were sentries at the door, and to one of them Hornblower handed over his horse as he entered. Pouzage was just ascending the stairs. Good evening, sir, said Pouzage with perfect courtesy. I am glad you have found your way to headquarters. I uh, trust it was without trouble. We are about to dine, and we will enjoy your company. Uh, you have your horse, I suppose. Uh, Madame de Villiers here will give uh, Monsieur de Villiers here will give orders for it to be looked after. I am sure. It was all hard to believe, 
It was hard to believe that the polished gentleman had just ordered the butchery that had just ended. It was hard to believe that the elegant young men with whom he sat at dinner were staking their lives on the overthrow of a barbarous but lusty young republic. But it was equally hard to believe, when he climbed into a four-poster bed that night, that he, midshipman hornblower, was in imminent deadly peril himself. Outside in the street, women wailed as the headless corpses, the harvest of the executions, were carried away, and he thought that he would never sleep. But youth and fatigue had their way, and he slept for most of the night. Obi awoke with a feeling that he was just been fighting off a nightmare. Everything was strange to him in the darkness, and it was several moments before he could account for the strangeness. He was in a bed, and not, as he had spent the the preceding three hundred nights, in a hammock, and the bed was steady as a rock instead of swaying about with the lively motion of a frigate. The stuffiness about him was the stuffiness of the bed curtains, and not the stuffiness of the midshipman's berth, with its compound smell of stale humanity and stale bilge water. He was on shore, in a house, in a bed, and everything about him was dead quiet, unnaturally so to a man accustomed to the noises of a wooden ship at sea. Of course, he was in a house in the town of Musiac in Brittany. He was sleeping in the headquarters of Brigadier General the Marquis de Pousaget, commanding the French troops who constituted part of this expedition, which was itself part of a larger force invading revolutionary France in the royalist cause. Hornblower felt a quickening of the pulse, a faint sick feeling of insecurity, as he realised afresh that he was now in France, ten miles from the sea and the indefatigable, with only a rabble of Frenchmen, half of them mercenaries, only nominally Frenchmen at that, around him to preserve him from death and from captivity. He regretted his knowledge of French. If he had had none, he would not be here, and good fortune might even have put him among the British half-battalion of the 43rd, guarding the ford half a mile away. It was partly the thought of the British troops which roused him out of bed. It was his duty to see that liaison was kept up with them, and the situation might have changed while he slept. He drew aside the bed curtains and stepped down to the floor. As his legs took the weight of his body, they protested furiously. All the riding he had done yesterday had left every muscle and joint so aching that he could hardly walk. But he hobbled in the darkness over to the window, found the latch of the shutters, and pushed them open. A three-quarter moon was shining down into the empty street of the town, and looking down, he could see the three-cornered hat of the sentry posted outside, and the bayonet reflecting the moonlight. Returning from the window, he found his coat and his shoes and put them on, belted his cutlass about him, and then he crept downstairs as quietly as he could. In the room off the entrance hall, a tallow dip guttered on the table, and beside it, a French sergeant slept with his head on his hands, lightly, for he raised his head as Hornblower paused in the doorway. On the floor of the room, the rest of the guard off duty were snoring stereously, huddled together like pigs in a sty, their muskets stacked against the wall. Hornblower nodded to the sergeant, opened the front door, and stepped out into the street. His lungs expanded gratefully as he breathed in the clean night air. Morning air, rather, for there to the east the sky was assuming a lighter tinge, and then the sentry, catching sight of the British naval officer, came clumsily to attention. In the square there still stood the gaunt, harsh framework of the guillotine, reaching up to the moonlight sky, and round us the black patch of blood of its victims. Hornblower wondered who they were. Who it could have been that the Royalists should seize and kill at such short notice, and decide that they must have been petty officials of the revolutionary government, the mayor and the customs officer and so on. If they were not merely men against whom the emigres had had cherished grudges since the days of the revolution itself. It was a savage, merciless world, and at the moment he was very much alone in it. Lonely, depressed, and unhappy. He was distracted from these thoughts by the sergeant of the guard emerging from the door with a file of men. The sentry in the street was relieved, and the party went on round the house to relieve the others. Then, across the street, he saw four drummers appear from another house, with a sergeant commanding them. They formed into a line, their drumsticks poised high before their faces, and then at a word from the sergeant, the eight drumsticks fell together with a crash, and the drummers proceeded to march slowly along the street beating out a jerky, exhilarating rhythm. At the first corner they stopped, and the drums rolled long and menacingly, and then they marched on again, beating out the previous rhythm. They were beating to arms, calling the men to their duties from their billets, and Hornblower, 
Tone deaf, but highly sensitive to rhythm, thought it was fine music. Real music. He turned back to headquarters with his depression falling away from him. The sergeant of the guard came marching back with the relieved sentries. The first of the awakened soldiers was beginning to appear sleepily in the streets. And then, with a clatter of hooves, a mounted messenger came riding up to headquarters, and the day was begun. A pale young French officer read the note to which the messenger had brought, and politely handed it to Hornblower to read. He had to puzzle over it for a space. He was not accustomed to handwritten French, but its meaning became clear to him at length. It implied no new development. The main expeditionary force landed yesterday at Quiberon, would move forward this morning on to Vannes and Rennes, while the subsidiary force to which Hornblower was attached must maintain its position at Musiac, guarding its flank. The Marquis de Posage, immaculate in his white uniform and blue ribbon, appeared at that moment, read the note without comment, and turned to Hornblower with a polite invitation to breakfast. They went back to the big kitchen with its copper cooking pans glittering on the walls, and a silent woman brought them coffee and bread. She might be a patriotic French woman and an enthusiastic counter-revolutionary, but she showed no signs of it. Her feelings, of course, might easily have been influenced by the fact that this horde of men had taken over her house and were eating her room, her food, and sleeping in her rooms without payment. Maybe some of the horses and wagons seized for the use of the army were hers too, and maybe some of the people who had died under the guillotine last night were her friends. But she brought coffee, and the staff, standing about the big kitchen with their spurs clinking, began to breakfast. Hornblower took his cup and a piece of bread. For four months before, this is the only, only bread he'd had had been ship's good biscuit, and sipped at the stuff. He was not sure if he liked it. He had only tasted coffee three or four times before, but the second time he raised his cup to his lips, he did not sip, because before he could do so, the distant boom of a cannon made him lower his cup and stand stock still. The cannon shot was repeated, and again, and then it was echoed by a sharper, nearer note. Midshipman Bracegirdle's six-pounders on the causeway. In the kitchen there was an instant stir and bustle. Somebody knocked a cup over and sent a river of black liquid swirling across the table. Somebody else managed to, scat to catch his spurs together so that he stumbled into somebody else's arms. Everybody seemed to be speaking at once. Hornblower was as excited as the rest of them. He wanted to rush out and see what was happening. But he thought at that moment of the disciplined calm which he had seen in HMS Indefatigable as she went into action. He was not this breed of Frenchman, and to prove it, he made himself put his cup to his lips again and drink calmly. Already, most of the staff had dashed out of the kitchen, shouting for their horses. It would take time to saddle up. He met Pouzeget's eye as, he, as the latter strode up and down the kitchen, and drained his cup. A trifle too hot for comfort, but he felt it was a good gesture. There was bread to eat and he made himself bite and chew and swallow, although he, had, as, although he had no appetite. If he was to be in the field all day, he could not tell when he would get his next meal, so he crammed a half a loaf into his pocket. The horses were being brought into the yard and saddled. The excitement had, effect, had infected them, and they, were pl they plunged and sidled about amid the curses of the officers. Pouzeget leapt up into the saddle and clattered away with the rest of his staff behind him, leaving behind only a single soldier holding Hornblower's roll. That was as it had better be. Hornblower knew that he would not keep a seat for half a minute if the horse took it into his head to plunge or rear. He walked slowly out to the animal, which was calmer now when the groom petted him, and climbed with infinite slowness and precaution into the saddle. With a pull at the bit, he checked the brute's exuberance and walked it sedately into the street and towards the bridge in the wake of the galloping staff. It was better to make sure of arriving by keeping his horse down to a walk than to gallop and to be thrown. The guns were still booming, and he could see the puffs of smoke from Bracegirdle's six-pounders. On his left, the sun was rising in a clear sky. As the, at the bridge, the situation seemed obvious enough. Where the arch had been blown up, a few skirmishers on either side were firing at each other from across the gap, and at the far end of the causeway, across the marae, a cloud of smoke revealed the presence of a hostile battery firing slowly and at extreme range. Beside the causeway on this side were Bracegirdle's two six-pounders, almost perfectly covered by a dip in the ground. Bracegirdle, with his cutlass belted around him, was standing between the guns which his party of seamen were working, and he waved his hand light-heartedly at Hornblower when he caught sight of him. A dark column of infantry appeared on the distant causeway. Bang! 
bang went Bracegirdle's guns. Hornblower's horse plunged at the noise, distracting him, but when he had time to look again, the column had disappeared. Then, suddenly, the causeway parapet near him flew into splinters. Something hit the roadbed beside his horse's feet, a tremendous blow, and passed on with a roar. That was the closest so far in his life that a cannon shot had missed him. He lost a stirrup, a stirrup during the resultant struggle with his horse, and deemed it wiser, as soon as he gained moderate control, to dismount and lead the animal off the causeway towards the guns. Bracegirdle met him with a grin. No chance of their crossing here, he said. At least not if the frogs stick to their work, and it looks as if they're willing to. The gap's within grape shot range, so they'll never bridge it. Can't think of what they're burning powder for. Testing our strength, I suppose, said Hornblower, with an air of infinite military wisdom. He would have been shaking with excitement if he had allowed his body to take charge. He did not know if he were being stilted unnaturally, but even if he were, that was better than to display excitement. There was something strangely pleasant, in a nightmare fashion, standing here, posing as a hardened veteran, with cannonballs howling overhead. Bracegirdle seemed happy and smiling and quite the master of himself, and Hornblower looked sharply at him, wondering if this were as much a pose as his own. He could not tell. Here they come again. Nope, only skirmishes this time round. A few scattered men were running out along the causeway to the bridge. At long musket range, they fell to the ground and began spasmodically firing. Already there were some dead men lying over there, and the skirmishers took cover behind the corpses. On this side of the gap, the skirmishers, better sheltered, fired back at them. They haven't a chance here at any rate, said Bracegirdle. And look there! The main body of the royalist force, summoned from the town, was marching up along the road while they watched it. A cannon shot from the other side struck the head of the column and ploughed into it. Hornblower saw dead men flung this way and that, and the column wavered. Pousaget came riding up and yelled orders, and the column, leaving its dead and wounded on the road, changed direction and took shelter in the marshy fields beside the causeway. With nearly all the royalist force assembled, it seemed indeed as if it would be utterly impossible for the revolutionaries to force a crossing here. I better report to the lobsters, said Hornblower. There was firing down that way at dawn, agreed Bracegirdle. Skirting the wide marsh here ran a narrow path through the lush grass, leading to the ford which the 43rd were guarding. Hornblower led his horse onto the path before he mounted. He felt he would be more sure than that way of persuading the horse to take that direction. It was not before he saw a dab of scarlet on the river bank, pickets thrown out from the main body to watch against any unlikely attempt to cross the marshes and stream round the British flank. Then he saw the cottage that indicated the site of the ford. In the field beside it was a wide patch of scarlet indicating that the main body was waiting for developments. At this point, the marsh narrowed where a ridge of slightly higher ground approached the water. A company of redcoats was drawn up here with Lord Edrington on horseback beside them. Hornblower rode up and made his report, somewhat jerkily as his horse moved restlessly under him. No serious attack, you say, said Edrington. No sign of one when I left, sir. Indeed. Edrington stared across the river. And here it's the same story. No attempt to cross the ford in force. Why should they show their hand and then not attack? I thought they were burning powder unnecessarily, sir, said Hornblower. They're not fools, snapped Edrington, with another penetrating look across the river. At any rate, there's no harm in assuming they're not. He turned his horse and cantered back to the main body, and gave an order to a captain, who scrambled to his feet to receive it. The captain bellowed an order, and his company stood up and fell into line, rigid and motionless. Two further orders turned them to the right, and marched them off in file. Every man in step, every musket sloped at the same angle. Edrington watched them go. No harm in having a flank guard, he said. The sound of a cannon across the water recalled them to the river. On the other side of the marsh, a column of troops could be seen marching rapidly along the bank. That's the same column coming back, sir, said the company commander. That or just another like it. Marching about and firing random shots, said Edrington. Mr. Hornblower, have the emigrate troops any flank guard out towards Keberon? Toward Keberon, sir, said Hornblower, taken aback. Damn it, can you not hear a plain question? Is there or is there not? I don't know, sir. Confle confu confessed Hornblower miserably. There were 5,000 emigrate troops at Keberon, and it seemed quite unnecessary to keep a guard out in that direction. Then present my compliments to the French emigre general, and suggest he post a strong detachment up the road if he's not done so already. 
Aye, aye, sir. Hornblower turned his horse's head back up the path toward the bridge. The sun was shining strongly now over the deserted fields. He could hear the occasional thud of a cannon shot, but overhead a lark was singing in the blue sky. Then, as he headed up the last low ridge towards Musiac and the bridge, he heard a sudden irregular outburst of firing. He fancied he heard screams and shouts, and what he saw as he topped the rise made him snatch at his reins and drag his horse to a halt. The fields before him were covered with, with fugitives in blue uniforms with white cross belts, all running madly towards him. In among the fugitives were galloping horsemen, whirling sabres that flashed in the sunshine. Farther out to the left, a whole column of horsemen were trotting fast across the fields, and farther back, the sun glittered on lines of bayonets moving rapidly from the high road toward the sea. There could be no doubt of what had happened. During those six seconds when he sat and stared, Hornblower realised the truth. The revolutionaries had pushed in force between Kiberon and Musiak, and, keeping the emigres occupied by demonstrations from across the river, had rushed down and brought off a complete surprise by this attack from an unexpected quarter. Heaven only knew what had happened at the Akiberon, but this was no time to think about that. Hornblower dragged his horse's head round and kicked his heels into the brute's side, urging him frantically back up the path toward the British. He bounced and rolled in the saddle, clinging on madly, consumed with fear lest he lose his seat and be captured by the pursuing French. At the clatter of hooves, every eye turned toward him. When he reached the British post, Edrington was there, standing with his horse's bridle over his arm. The French! yelled Hornblower hoarsely, pointing back. They're coming! I expected nothing else, said Edrington. He shouted an order before he put his foot into the stirrup to mount. The main body of the 43rd was standing in line by the time he was in the saddle. His adjutant went galloping off to recall the company from the water's edge. The French are in force. Horse, foot, and guns, I suppose? Horse and foot at least, sir, gasped Hornblower, trying to keep his head clear. I saw no guns, and the emigres are running like rabbits. Yes, sir. Well, here come the first of them. Over the nearest ridge, a few blue uniforms made their appearance. The wearer still running while stumbling with fatigue. I suppose we must cover their retreat, although they're not worth saving, said Edrington. Look there! The company he had sent out as a flank guard was in sight on the crest of a slight slope. It was formed into a tiny square, red against the green, and as they watched they saw a mob of horsemen flood up the hill towards it and break into an eddy around it. Mm, well, just as well I had them posted there, remarked Edrington calmly. Ah, here comes Maine's company. The force from the ford came marching up. Harsh orders were shouted. Two companies wheeled round while the sergeant major with his sabre and silver-headed cane regulated the pace and the alignment, as if the men were on the barrack square. "'I would suggest you stay by me, Mr. Hornblower,' said Edrington. He moved his horse up into the interval between the two columns, and Hornblower followed him dumbly. Another order, and the force began to march steadily across the valley, the sergeants calling the step, and the sergeant major watching the intervals. All around them, were now were fleeing emigre soldiers, most of them in the last stages of exhaustion. Hornblower noticed more than one of them fall down on the ground, gasping and incapable of further movement. And then, over the low slope to the right, appeared a line of plumes, a line of sabres, a regiment of cavalry trotting rapidly forward. Hornblower saw the sabres lifted, saw the horses break into a gallop, and heard the charges of yelling men. The redcoats around him halted. Another shouted order, another slow, deliberate movement, and the half-battalion was in a square with the mounted officers in the centre and the colours waving over their heads. The charging horsemen were less than a hundred yards away. Some officer with a deep voice began giving orders, intoning them as if in some solemn ceremony. The first order brought the muskets from the men's shoulders, and the second was answered by a simultaneous click of open priming pans. The third order brought the muskets to present along one face of the square. Too high, said the sergeant major. Lower there, number seven. The charging horsemen were only thirty yards away. Hornblower saw the leading men, their cloaks flying from their shoulders, leaning along their horses' necks with their sabres pointed forward at the full stretch of their arms. Fire, said the deep voice. In reply came a single sharp explosion as every musket went off at once. The smoke swirled round the square and disappeared. Where Hornblower had been looking, 
There were now only a score of horses and men on the ground, some struggling in agony, some lying still. The cavalry regiment split like a torrent encountering a rock, and hurtled harmlessly past the, the other faces of the square. Well done, said Edrington. The deep voice was intoning again. Like marionettes all on the same string, the company had fired. Na the company that had fired now reloaded. Every man biting out his bullet at the same instant. Every man ramming home his charge. Every man spitting his bullet into his musket barrel with the same instantaneous inclination of the head. Edrington looked keenly at the cavalry collecting together in a disorderly mob down the valley. The forty-third will advance. He ordered. With solemn ritual, the square opened up again into two columns and continued its interrupted march. The, the detached company came marching up to join them from out of a ring of dead men and horses. Someone raised a cheer. Silence in the ranks, bellowed the sergeant major. Sergeant, take that man's name. But Hornblower noticed how the sergeant major was eyeing keenly the distance between the columns. It had to be maintained exactly so that a company wheeling back filled it to make the square. Here they come again, said Edrington. The cavalry were forming for a new charge, but the square was ready for them. Now the horses were blown and the men were less enthusiastic. It was not a solid wall of horses that came down on them, but isolated groups, rushing first at one face and then at another, and pulling up or swerving aside as they reached the line of bayonets. The attacks were too feeble to meet with company volleys. At the word of command, sections here and there gave fire to the more determined groups. Hornblower saw one man, an officer judging by his gold lace, rein up before the bayonets and pull out a pistol. Before he could discharge it, half a dozen muskets went off together. The officer's face became a horrible, bloody mask, and he and his horse fell together to the ground. Then all at once the cavalry wheeled off, like starlings over a field, and then the march could be resumed. No discipline about these frogs, not on either side, said Edrington. The march was headed for the sea the blessed shelter of the indefatigable, but it seemed to Hornblower as if the pace was intolerably slow. The men were marching at the parade step, with agonising deliberation, while all around them and far ahead of them, the fugitive emigres poured in a broad stream towards safety. Looking back, Hornblower saw the fields full of marching columns, hurrying swarms, rather, of revolutionary infantry in hot pursuit of them. Once let men run, and you can't do anything else with them, commented Edrington, following Hornblower's gaze. Shouts and shots over to the flank caught their attention. Trotting over the fields, leaping wildly at the bumps, came a cart drawn by a lean horse. Someone in a seaman's frock and trousers was holding the reins. Other seamen were visible over the sides, firing muskets at horsemen hovering about them. It was Bracegirdle with his dung cart. He might have lost his guns, but he'd saved his men. The pursuers dropped away as the cart neared the columns. Bracegirdle, standing up in the cart, caught sight of Hornblower on his horse and waved to him excitedly. Bode a sea and a chariot, he yelled. I'll thank you, sir, shouted Edrington with the lungs of brass, to go on and prepare for our embarkation. Aye, aye, sir. The lean horse trotted on with the cart lurching after it, and the grinning seamen clinging on to the sides. At the flank appeared a swarm of infantry, a mad gesticulating crowd, half running to cut off the 43rd's retreat. Edrington swept his glance round the field. The 43rd will form line, he shouted. Like some ponderous machine, well oiled, the half battalion fronted towards the swarm. The columns became lines, each man moving into his position like bricks laid on a wall. The 43rd will advance. The scarlet line swept forward, slowly, inexorably. The swarm hastened to meet us, officers to the front, waving their swords and calling on their men to follow. Make ready! Every musket came down together. The priming pans clicked. Present! Up came the muskets, and the swarm hesitated before that fearful menace. Individuals tried to get back into the crowd to cover themselves from the volley with the bodies of their comrades. Fire! A crashing volley. Hornblower, looking over the heads of the British infantry from his point of vantage on horseback, saw the whole face of the swarm go down into swaths. Still the red line moved forward. At each deliberate step, a shouted order brought a machine-like response as the men reloaded. Five hundred mouths spit in five hundred bullets. Five hundred right arms raised five hundred ramrods at once. And when the musket came to the present to present, the red line was at the swath of the dead and wounded. 
for the swarm had withdrawn before the advance, and shrank back further still at the threat of the volley. The volley was fired. The advance went on. Another volley, another advance. And now the swarm was shredding away. Now men were running from it. Now every man had turned tail and fled from that frightful musketry. The hillside was black with fugitives, as it had been when the emigres were fleeing. Halt! The advance ceased. The line became a double column, and the retreat began again. Very creditable, remarked Edrington. Hornblower's horse was trying jerkily to pick its way over a carpet of dead and wounded. And he was so busy, keeping his seat, and his brain was in such a whirl, that he did not immediately realise that they had topped the last rise, so that before them lay the glittering waters of the estuary. The strip of muddy beach was packed solid with emigres. There were the ships, riding at anchor, and there, the blessed sight, were the boats swarming towards the shore. It was high time for all it was high time, for already the boldest of the revolutionary infantry were hovering round the columns, taking long shots into them. Here and there a man fell. Close up snapped the sergeants, and the files marched on stolidly, leaving the wounded and the dead behind them. The adjutant's horse suddenly kicked, snorted, and plunged, and then fell first into its knees and kicking to its side while the freckle-faced adjutant freed his feet from the stirrups and flung himself out of the saddle, just in time to escape being pinned underneath. "'Are you hit, Stanley?' asked Edrington. "'No, my lord, all safe and sound,' said the adjutant, blushing or brushing his scarlet coat. "'You won't have to foot it far,' said Edrington. "'No need to throw out the skirmishers to drive those fellows off. This is where we make our stand.' He looked about him at the fishermen's cottages above the beach, the panic-stricken emigres at the water's edge, and the masses of revolutionary infantry coming up in pursuit, leaving small enough time for preparation. Some of the redcoats poured into the cottages, appearing a moment later at the windows. It was fortunate that the fishing hamlet guarded one flank of the gap down to the beach, while the other was guarded by a steep and inaccessible headland, on whose summit a small block of redcoats established themselves. In the gap between the two points, the remaining four companies formed a long line, just sheltered by the crest of the beach. The boats of the squadron were already loading with emigres along the small breakers below. Hornblower heard the crack of a single pistol shot. He could guess that some officer down there was enforcing his orders in the only possible way to prevent the fear-driven men from pouring into the boats and swamping them. As if in answer came the roar of a cannon on the other side. A battery of artillery had unlimbered just out of musket range and was firing at the British position, while all about it gathered the mass battalions of the revolutionary infantry. The cannonballs howled close overhead. Let them fire away, said Edrington. The longer the better. The artillery could do little harm to the British in the fold of ground that protected them, and the revolutionary commander must have realised that as well, as the necessity for wasting no time. Over there the drums began to roll a noise of indescribable menace, and the column surged forward. So close were they that Hornblower had, could already see the features of the officers in the lead, waving their hats and swords. Forty-third, make ready, said Edrington, and the priming pans clicked as one. Seven paces forward, march! One or two, three, seven paces, painstakingly taken, took the line to the little crest. Present! Fire! A volley nothing could withstand. The columns halted, swayed, received another smashing volley, and then another, and fell back in ruin. Excellent, said Edrington. The battery boomed again. A file of two redcoat soldiers was tossed back like dolls to lie in a horrible bloody mass close beside Hornblower's horse's feet. Close up, close up, said a sergeant, and the men on either side had filled the gap. Forty-third, seven paces, back, march! The line was below the crest again, as the red-coated marionettes withdrew in steady time. Hornblower could not remember later whether it was twice or three times more that the revolutionary masses came on again, each time to be dashed back by that disciplined musketry. But the sun was nearly setting in the ocean behind him when he looked back to see the beach almost cleared, and Bracegirdle plodding up to them to report. "'I can spare one company now,' said Hendrickson in reply, but not taking his eyes off the French masses. After they on board, have every boat ready and waiting. One company filed off. Another attack was beaten back. After the preceding failures, it was not pressed home with anything like the dash and fire of the earlier ones. 
Now the battery was turning its attention to the headland on the flank, sending its balls among the redcoats there, while a battalion of French moved over to the attack at that point. That gives us time, said Edrington. Captain Griffin, you can march the men off. Colour party, remain here. Down the beach went the centre companies to the waiting boats, while the colours still waved to mark their old position, visible over the crest of the French. The company and the cottages came out, formed up, and marched down as well. Edrington t- uh, trotted across to the foot of the little headland. He watched the French forming for the attack, and the infantry wading out to their boats. Now, grenadiers, run for it! Colour party! Down the last, down the steep seaward face of the headland came the last company, running, sliding, and stumbling. A musket, clumsily handled, went off unexpectedly. The last man came down the slope as the colour party reached the water's edge and began to climb into a boat with its precious burden. A wild yell went up from the French, and their whole mass came rushing towards the evacuated position. Now, sir, said Edrington, turning his horse seaward. Hornblower fell from his saddle as his horse splashed out into the shallows. He let go of the reins and plunged out, waist-deep, shoulder-deep, to where the longboat lay at its oars with its four-pounder gun on its bows. Bracegirdle beside it to haul him in. He looked up in time to see a curious incident. Edrington had reached the indefatigable's gig, still holding his horse's reins. With the French pouring down the beach towards them, he turned and took a musket from the nearest soldier, pressed the muzzle to the horse's head, and fired. The horse fell in its death agony in the shallows. Only Hornblower's roan remained as prize to the revolutionaries. Backward up, said Bracegirdle, and the longboat backed away from the beach. Hornblower lay in the eyes of the boat, feeling as if he had not the strength to move a limb, and the beach was covered by shouting, gesticulating Frenchmen, lit redly by the sunset. One moment, said Bracegirdle, reaching for the lanyard of the four-pounder and tugging at it smartly. The gun roared out in Hornblower's ear, and the charge cut a swath of destruction across the beach. That was canister, said Bracegirdle. Eighty-four balls. Easy port. Give way starboard. The longboat turned away from the beach and towards the welcoming ships. Hornblower looked back at the darkening coast of France. This was the end of an incident. His country's attempt to overturn the revolution had been met with bloody repulse. Newspapers in Paris would exult. The Gazette in London would give the incident five cold lines. Clairvoyant, Hornblower could foresee that in a year's time the world would hardly remember the incident. In twenty years it would be entirely forgotten. Yet those headless corpses up there in Musiac, those shattered redcoats, those Frenchmen caught in the four-pounders blast of Canada, canister, they were all as dead as if it had just been a day in which history had been changed. And he was just as weary. And in his pocket there was still the bread he had put in there that morning and forgotten all about.